So my name is Hui Yun. Today I'm going to carry on the system webinar series. So my topic today is introduction to the system ESP. So my presentation includes five parts. I will start to introduce the basics of ESD, how people do with uh, serial sectioning uh, to achieve three ESD, how about instruments, the PFIB, what we to use at 6M for the three ESD. After that, I will talk about how we prepare the sample for the three ESD application, especially the block lift out. After that, I will talk about uh, how we use the uh, auto-specimen view uh, from some official for the data acquisition. Uh, then I will talk about uh, how we can use some open source software for the data processing. I will end my presentation with some concurrence and the acknowledgments. So EBSD stands for Electron Backscale Diffraction. So as you can see from this shamar here, with your uh, priming arrived on a well-polished sample, which uh, is highly tilted to a certain degree, your backscat action will be projected onto your uh, best camera. After that, the uh, pattern will be indexed by the software you use. Uh, uh, all on board, so that you can do either crystal orientation mapping, uh, strain mapping, or even face identification. So the reason we chose the sample to 70 degrees is because we want to uh, yield a high number of uh, back scan action. So a little physics about ESD. As you can see here, your primary beam arrived on your sample surface. With that, uh, initially it was uh, scattered a little in all the directions. But it's only these some uh, actions which uh, is matching the brand diffraction will be scattered elastic uh, incoherently onto your ESD uh, camera to form the cube shape bands. So here the bands uh, originate from the plants HKL. So all the intersection plants form this EBSD pattern. So here is an example of ESD pattern after the back, background subtraction. So how can we interpret this pattern with this image of plenty of dynamic inside it. So Hof transform is usually used for this kind of purpose. To do that, you transfer one lines in your patterns into uh, one point in your whole space. So all the line belong to one bound will be uh, amplified into one point uh, in your whole space. So by that, if you compare the end bound angles between the different planes and the com and to compare that to the exist phase you have inputted uh, into your ESD software, that allows you to identify the real angle of uh, this orientation. With that, uh, the pattern got indexed. So the question now is, uh, sorry for this raw data uh, EBS method without any like uh, noise reduction. So if the EBSD is a routine used technique, why do we still like go to 3D? So to answer that question, I would say much more like uh, the, if you are watching your movie like in the cinema, it's okay. Why we are still going to the Emax? For movie, maybe you have a better like uh, visualization effect to, 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 the, to the things. But for the 3 ESD, there are some scientific 
like challenge or question you to answer why we need a 3D. So for 3D, if you look at something in 3D that will like answer the question like what about the real green size of your of your sample, what about the dislocation density in 3D? So also in 3D that in, in practice or in application that can answer some question like how about the parent of the mountain sites, how about the green reconstruction? If you look at the in, that in 3D, that will give you more information about that. Especially uh, one most important uh, application of the 3D BSD, I will say is much more the calculation of the green boundary because green boundary is a three dimensional microstructure. So it is characterized by five independent crystallographic par parameters. So all the these three, like uh, the latitude distribution orientation between two green, the three Euler angle is okay to cal to colorize with the two D uh, the traditional ESD, but the two additional like parameters define the plan normal. You need to go to into three D to uh, to identify them. So talking about three D ESD. So how can people access to the 3D, uh, the third dimension of your image? So here is an example uh, from the early development. As you can see here, the sample is mounted on some stage. You have some um, polish tool, so you spread your alcohol on it. You polish, you clean with a vacuum. After that, you put that into the camera take some image and start uh, image by image, you have your scene, uh, your image in 3D. Here is not uh, a real uh, EBSD, it's much more like uh, you have some contrast from your, 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 your camera to see your, your green here, for example, is a reconstructor aluminum silicon alloy, which allow you to see the, the different deployment of aluminum and silicon. But the question here is now asking how exact, how precise your, your meaning here. For example, in exper uh, uh, risk contraction with a nominal thickness is five micro, but in reality, you got 4.75 uh, micro. So it's not that well controlled, but People are intelligent and trying to invent something. So here now, we are, I'm going to show you a uh, very recent development at uh, Max Planck uh, in Germany, how people use uh, robots and how they put So that's a very cool development, I will say, concerning the 3DBSD tool by using this really this um, raw polishing serial sectioning. So what is interesting in the development is instead of like polish your scene without any, um, without uh, with little control, so they put some big show onto the cross section. So as you can see here, you have these two parallel in the middle. It's much more you that allows you to align like in X and Y for your slides. And these inclined uh, lines allow you to control your, your the thickness, how thin uh, each slice was removed. So after that, I think they uh, success in uh, doing something like a dozens image to extract some, uh, like uh, here, some uh, the color, the characteristic of green boundary and also the texture. So talking about these things, uh, the 3D ESD in the field has been developed for a long time. So the first paper, if I remember well, was uh, out in 24. So here is an illustration of how about the different configuration you have, can have with, uh, with a field. So 
according to the the uh, relative position between your fifth column and the biggest biggest camera, you have uh, this three configuration. So the tilt setup. So uh, all and all, you what you want to match here is like uh, you have your your cross section like is parallel to your uh, fifth beam for the beating position. And that cross section is tilt to seven seven degree for your EGSD. So for the tilt setup, you tilt between these two. Maybe you need to adjust like uh, the X and the Y to put your uh, uh, medium increase and your B. So the rotation uh, setup is you. Uh, go always between these two positions, but with the rotation of uh, state of 180 degrees. So this tilt setup and the rotation setup has been commercialized, so it's, uh, it's well developed, developed with the different constructor. So another uh, interesting thing here is a static setup. That means your sample stays static during the acquisition. So you won't introduce extra movements, so no more need for this extra alignment registration. But the thing with this static setup is the angle of this ESD camera is in a very weird, uh, in a very specific angle. So you need a specific design ESD camera uh, um, chamber to accommodate this uh, setup. So back to our business today. So what we use at the CCM now for these days is this uh, Leos G4 P3, which has been seen, uh, installed since May 2018. So it is equipped with a uh, high resolution Aster big ICM column and an inductive coupled xenon plasma source ion gun. So with the ICM column, you pretty much uh, have an dimension mode uh, plus the monochromator, which allows you to go to some spectral resolution below one nanometer. And also it's equipped with uh, some deep deceleration, which allows you to work on some of this um, uh, non-conductive sample. And with different detectors, especially the TLD and the CDS, which allows you to go to uh, very high resolution and the inversion mode. So, what makes this plasma field special is its source. So, we can attend 2.5 microampere. So, comparing to the traditional gallium source, which is limited to 100 nanopair, so you Basically, you have 25 times faster beating. So, concerning the gas for deposition, you have tungsten, platinum, and carbon, and you also have the uh, possibility to use mix them. And the xenon dipolar and the DX for uh, etching. It's also equipped with an easy lift, which is con fully controlled by the mouse and the new chamber plasma cleaner of uh, samples. On the analytical path, it's equipped with the uh, Oxford Instrument S2 ESD camera, which is a uh, direct uh, detector camera, which allows to go to uh, 4,500 PPS uh, pattern at this speed. And also, there is an Ultra Max 100 ESD detector. So, a little about the the literature about the this xenon plasma field compared to the traditional uh, gallium field. So how the ga uh, the xenon was generated? So you have your bottle of gas xenon connected to your plasma cell. So that would uh, with apply apply a really frequency through the anatomy. So that will create the impaction field to remove electron to cause ionization of the xenon by applying some extraction 
voltage so that accelerates the signal into your feed column. So in practice, it's operational uh, emission current is as high as 200 micron here that allow you to have beam current go as high as 2.5 micron here. So remind you the gallium source used in the traditional feed, you heat your gallium, uh, your low melting gallium to some point if you uh, combine a constant extraction voltage and uh, gradually decrease the suppressor voltage to maintain a constant current basically uh, around two microns so that will allow you only an operating uh, current around 100 ampere so remind you this these things you need to uh, maintain them. If you want to have a stable uh, beam current here, you probably need to adjust this thing. You might need to even to heat your source sometimes. So which is a kind of a problematic for long time tomography running. So the first thing come to uh, comes to mind is the volume prop can be problem with uh, these two. Uh, different source. As you can see here, the xenon is kind of uh, much bigger, which which allows to access to like a, a big size to give you some good statistic or rating of your of your sample. Another thing uh, why the xenon is interesting is because of uh, less ion damage here. So here is uh, some simulation. Uh, showing the impact between your ion beam and your electricity. So even this simulation is run on some amorphous silicon that can still give you the idea how deep the damage can go with the gallium fib and how is the xenon fib uh, is shallow. So here is an image showing you how uh, how uh, the gallium can damage match your sample. Here is some aerogel uh, amorph uh, zinc oxide and alumina. So if we look at age here, so the zinc, the zinc oxide has been depleted. So for xenon, you go to something around the say maybe 200, 300 nanometer, but with the, zinc, uh, with the gallium that go up even to micron range already. So that's for the amorph materials. So how else that thing for the crystalline, for the DDSD we are going to talk about today. So here is an example showing with the gallium, on, especially on the tungsten kyvi, with the current as high even as uh, 20 nanopera, you have this low quality chemistry pattern, so that will introduce this kind of miss. Without uh, interpreting carefully, you might introduce this misinformation of your, your growing structure. So comparing with that, with xenon, you have, um, even with 60 nanopair, you can still have good dynamic and good quality chemistry pattern. So, you have no problem to index that. So, by the way, so what people do typically in, in gallium fig is they add another additional uh, meaning, like the cleaning on the surface. For example, here, you if you go to one nano, that allows to clean your thing, so to uh, improve your your EBSD. So somebody from uh, UC Santa Barbara extends this uh, uh, cubic patterns to some extra uh, beam source. So uh, argon, the broader ion beam argon, give us a good uh, cubic pattern like that. And also, 
what is uh, exciting is about this laser thing. So you see here, uh, with even with very high energy laser, you can get a very good diffraction pattern. So here is some image to show uh, to illustrate the the very last development of this PBSD. So basically, it's kind of like uh, that video I'm showing to you. So that instead of pump, pumping completely the chamber here, they use a closed lock. So you have this robotic arm to grab that sample from the chamber and between your, your beam. So the very, very last relevance of this thing is the laser. But the laser thing here, as you can see by this image, uh, which I believe is from a uh, Zeiss uh, one. So it's showing this laser induced period of surface structure here. That's a hint. Uh, the secondary electron, but that doesn't uh, hint your DBSD uh, signal since your backscat. Uh, for this thing, you work at high voltage. It's original at least like 20 to 50 nanometer between your, uh, your sample. So above that, I hope I have uh, shown you the very last development of the 3D ESD, the technique side especially. So back to our business at CCM, how we do the 3D BSD here, the xenon thing. So we start with the sample preparation. So like uh, everything else, like the EBSD. So you first want an EBSD ready sample. So if uh, you are interested in this thing, I believe my colleague has shown uh, a very good webinar about this project, how to prepare sample. So after that, you need to pr put your protection layer on top of, of your lithium interest. Uh, here, your, your lithium of interest needs to be at the edge of your sample, since that uh, the signal won't be shadowed by, uh, by your, your sample cell, and the signal can go your EBSD camera. So another thing which is important here is, for example, that was the reading we just prepared. But if you go to the bottom of that thing, you might get this shadowing or like uh, the thing uh, from your sample cell. Remind you that black angle is something around one degree. So anything below this, your region of interest might shadow your, your uh, QPC packet. So what you can do is you cut that off so that you can get good uh, EBSD map. Uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, with uh, a small volume, it's okay to cut that off. But with some big volume, if you want to really remove this bottom thing, that's, that's time consuming. So what we propose here is this block lift out from your above sample. So you start uh, with your deposition of your back sample. You put your different uh, mini bugs. So around your region of interest. After that, you go stage tier zero, cut the bottom. You attach your manipulator to the volume and you can extract it. So after that, this sample can go on to some, for example, here on to a silicon wafer on a pre-cured chip holder. So in that way, you don't have any shadowing here on the sample. So what makes this bulk uh, 
lift out the interesting is much more like the lift out. For example, here is a sample. You might say here is my region of interest. So by this block lift out, you can lift out your volume of interest and keep it in a very controlled way. For example, that was the initial image for the destruction, and that was the control structure from the 3D BSD. So you keep well your just ensure that you are uh, investigating. So look at you have these different drawings, which is basically this one we have touched and very clear. So which makes this block lift out very powerful uh, technique to work on the sample. So now since we have the sample is ready, how we do exactly uh, in reality real for the acquisition. So we since if you look at the image here of this peak, we have your EBS camera is on the same side of um, your iron column. So we are doing this always in, in the rotation setup. So the sample can either go on this uh, virtual holder if we are working on some small volume or it can go as as I just illustrated with the block lift out onto some some silicon uh, wafer like that. So it's just some little words about this small holder. So the holder we uh, kind of designed is just if your sample is sitting on some aluminum that uh, stand stuff that can go into this hole and uh, screw here. So you have this thing is pretty at 36 degree and also on the other side which is pretty at 34 which allow the regular DSD uh, map on that. So once your sample is ready we go between the meeting position and Position. Again, you want to uh, reach the angle, for example, here the angle between your electron column and the eye column is 52, so with a tilt of uh, uh, static tilt of 16 degrees, that gives you 52. So <coughs> here is the interface from the uh, auto slicer for this routine uh, acquisition. So this figure shall define the, the which allows you to find the, the figure shaw after your stage of movement. So this yellow box define the area you are going to work on. So on EBSD position, you might need to uh, move your sample a little down uh, with a larger working distance. So you have your, your pattern center is on top of your uh, finish pattern. So after that, on your EBSD uh, position, we use always the same try to re, uh, retract the region of interest by identifying this individual in your SEM image. So another thing here is uh, for some sample uh, the, the behave between the arm, your xenon beam and your sample might be strange so we should cause this uh, Cutting effect. So what we propose here is the rocking polish. So instead of being from top down like this way, we do with the 
small uncle. So that uh, helps a lot to reduce the cutting. For example, here you can see how how bad was the cross section before the rocking polish, and how this small structure, like the future, showed that already after rocking polish. So we repeat the kitchen, the DDS deposition, and another thing which is the parameter you define how many slides uh, you want to apply your DDS map. So this is back again to the, the DDS resolution. So it's like uh, because with the traditional EDS you need two D and polyvalves, we have the room of some uh, room of some like uh, you want to have ten uh, points with uh, with your drawing, so you in that way you can well interpret your uh, brain structure. So that is still the same uh, rule here, but think about the thing in three, three dimension is the depth resolution of your of your EDS. So for example we are doing here every two slides so that means it will do that rocking on both angle and uh, go back to the same position for your EDS map. So here is the image to illustrate these two EDS uh, position, the EDS position and the EU position. During the whole time your EDS camera uh, standing always there. So once after your acquisition you have your serious stack of image data. Sorry. So how uh, how can you uh, treat your data? So either you treat your ESD map as an image like this, so you can extract them use a different software like 3G, like Dragonfly, like Parigo, Amira to work them based on uh, an image. But also you have the option to export export them like in CTF much more I will say it's uh, like a universal format can be opened by other software. So concerning the data processing software you probably have a different one from the constructors like the main constructor of the ESD camera index broker of photo instrument. So there's also some open source uh, software, there's Matex, which uh, can, can be run itself in the MATLAB or from the platform. And also there's a Team 3D, which has been developed a long time. So here is um, <coughs> like the, the process procedure I copied from the Dream 3D website showing you how to uh, to do your data processing. So you start with so I will I will talk about all these buttons and to give you some uh, screenshot uh, but here is give you an idea how we uh, treat or process the 3D ES data. So the H5 ESD is again a former like the open source big IP uh, everybody can open it. So after that you might want to spread hold some object which have some in your in your ES body you might have some bad point which is that uh, black box in dots in your ESD map. After that you need to align the different section based on the presentation. Again, like in the EDSD, you might want to clean up your, uh, your, your brain, like to 
based on your neighbor. After that, you can segment that to try to isolate your green to assign some ID. After that, you can like uh, the regular ESD, you can compute the different like the green size, like the green uh, how about the neighbors, and after that you can call them. Okay, dream three. Dream three here is a screenshot of the software. So it have different um, parts. So on the left, what is they call the pipeline? So the pipeline grab the the function from the library. So here, uh, for example, we are showing how you can. I I will detail that uh, uh, just. Uh, so this middle region is the main parameter related to this function you have selected. So you have this top part is your your data structure is showing basically what uh, what is the data is acting now in this function, and after that this top, uh, part is the uh, they call it the filter, but it's much more the function might be. See here. So the bottom is the uh, output of the pipeline. How about, uh, for example, how about uh, scene control? How about the result? So <clears throat> to um, process your 3 d EBS data has generated from that application, the first thing you want to do is to convert this .ctf files to a Format it can be uh, accepted by this format. So the parameter you want to, to input is much more the Z spacing, which is defined by that thickness we defined and how many slides we uh, we acquired in this path. So here the zero point three because my thickness uh, mean thickness was. Uh, 150 nanometer, and I acquired every two sides. So that means my Z spacing is 0 0.3 micro, 300 nanometers. So in this import, this is a, an open C, a CTF file to show to show. So basically, the system is reading all the parameters inside the C, uh, CTF file. So the how many points you have collected uh, given by this green number. How about the step size you define in the PSD map? How about uh, the different value? As you can see, you have the different column here, which basically corresponding to this thing you are going to read into your. H5 PS data, you have the bands, you have the, uh, which most important is this uh, early long goals, three early long goals, you have uh, the mat value BC, which might be uh, used for the following part. So for uh, stress holding your, your point, again, you might have some point which is your compression is not that great, you cannot index them. So in that way, um, maybe also like on the green boundary, you have some overlap from two uh, lattice. So you have a very bad uh, uh, boundary contrast there. So this function allow you to stretch hold them. For example, here I have defined 128 to basically to them out. So after that, you align your the different section between uh, based on the misorientation of the orientation. So, for example, uh, we use a chorus of five degree. That means the brain between two sides that is uh, at this value. I'm I'm talking about the uh, 
the odor on the ball. If that is kind of disliked, it will cancel that at the same word. So after that, like uh, in the traditional ESD, you uh, calculate always give a tolerance of the misorientation and the based on the downflow of the neighbors around your that point that allows you to clean clean up the data. So after that, you might want to segment. Uh, I mean, try to identify the future. So here, again, we use uh, a tolerance in this article on five degree, and also we use this that mass area has been uh, created in the second half. So after all these things, you can bring your save your data into a um, format which is called Dream Three D. So that you can read it again for following. I will talk about that later. And also, you want to check this uh, write this file because that is a format which we need to use another software called Paraview to see the volume like things. So once you have your three D volume, so you can play with it to see whatever the future you are. So you can go into your scene. So here it's always that algorithm some pop, but there are some 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 different different depending on what kind of sample you are for example. You can start to look at the button set parents going here already if that is that is the case. So uh, also some uh, even uh, in depth analysis of your some uh, data. So, for example, that former that dot dream three D file has been created from the last day can be read again and put into some former. So, we can start to analyze the morphology statistics. So that will uh, transform that former into a dot CSV. So this dot CSV start to like uh, like some normal file format. For example, here you have your accurate di diameter. That's uh, start you start to to pull the real grain size of your sample. And also here you have the different aspect ratio. So it can show you how the grain looks like in three D. If you don't get it, if the circular um, like uh, circular. Again, you have the different functionality in Dream 3D. Here, you can also do your statistical crystallography. What about the texture of your sample? So, after that, I would like to conclude my presentation. So, PFAB is a good uh, tool which with low ion damage, which can Quick prepare reading of your trees and the start of the ESD. And also here at CCM is a plasma B plus that direct uh, action uh, ESD camera that allows you to very efficient and control 3D ESD acquisition. So after that, with this thing I'm showing with the Dream 3D, so which uh, for me, it's a very dedicated 3D ES data treatment and analysis. So all these things we see from that uh, Excel is ready for publications already. So with that, I would like to thank uh, 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 collaborators to bring the new system up and also allow me to, to show their result here. Especially uh, Adam from some of Control for his uh, patient journey on this side, uh, and also join uh, to that uh, that small folder, which is useful, and also the faculty members to bring this interesting sample. Uh, sorry, the the PFIB and also the EBSD and the ESD data. Thank you for your attention.
Thanks, Huey. That was a great presentation. Um, there's a couple questions in the Q&A, and if anyone has more, please feel free to put them in. Uh, so the first question, what is the highest spatial, spatial resolution that one can achieve in 3D EBSD maps using the PFIB? And what is the optimum beam current that one can use, although I'm sure it depends upon the sample and parameters? So talking about the EBSD, uh, uh, 3D EBSD uh, spatial resolution, so the first thing that came, uh, came to my mind is like, the, again, we talk about the spatial resolution of EBSD. Because EBSD, you have like uh, this, BSD, you have this non symmetry uh, uh, spatial resolution on X. You, the, your best one is X. The Y, the y because you are projecting, so your resolution is like three times, two to three times worse. But talk about the Z position. So that depends uh, on different parameters, depends on what about the voltage you use, what about the material you use. For my uh, case, so I will say like a regular thing, I was using the 50 nanometer peak is always the general 3D ESD special resolution. And uh, sorry, Sam, I, 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 I forget the question. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it was a long question. Um, and then could you comment on the optimum beam current that one can use? So uh, that thing is, um, that depends on your material. So if we, if we go again to that, uh, uh, the, the stream uh, simulation here, so we, by changing the materials, your this amorph uh, layer kind of change. So by default, for example, I work on some steel, I can go as high as like 200 ampere, it's still fine. So basically you spend like one minute for your beam and uh, another one minute for your ESD body. Hope that just a follow up on that, um, Hui, if you're not sure because you haven't, let's say, done the experiment before or you wor you're working with a new material, would you suggest just running um, experiments to see what beam current is best or maybe starting with some simulations of the material? Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Um, and then another question. Which software can one use to get 3D orientation and pull figures from the 3D data set? So uh, that thing I still think about, uh, let me just repeat. <laughs> I know there are some uh, commercial software might exist from, from Google, but that thing was in, in collaboration so in my mind, I think uh, Clips 3D should have that function. 